everyone. Welcome to our final session of the conference uh, on managing growth for social inclusion. This session will be uh, this, this is a special session. This session will be chaired by Dr. Sarah Rajan, ACTD Director of Tamil and Professor at the Department of Economics, University of Dhaka. And the department uh, and the discussion for the session will be Dr. Uh, Saima Hawk Vidisha, Research Director, Tamil and Associate Professor at the, at the Department of Economics, University of Dhaka. Uh, our presentation for this session, uh, our presenters for this session are Ms. Seema Rahman. Uh, she's a student at the Department of Economics, University of Dhaka. Mr. Azza Putin Ahmad, student at the Department of Economics and Social Science, Bragg University. And Ms. Tahia Anand Mira, student at the Department of Economics, University of Dhaka. Can I please request our chair, Dr. Sadiq Rahman, to start the session? Thank you. Uh, it's been a long day, and uh, we are at the very last session. And I'm thankful to uh, not not the students, but those who are not students. They are here to listen to what the students say. So again, thank you because I think uh, you know uh, your presence and your actually comments uh, will inspire the students uh, to work you know better in the future. <laughs> so, uh, I remember while I was uh, taking a lecture at the uh, university, uh, not in Dhaka, because I don't really want to mess up with my students who are in Dhaka University. <laughs> so, uh, I saw one uh, student was sleeping, kind of, in the lecture. So I said, uh, you can't sleep in my lecture. He said, sir, if you could have been a little bit quieter, I could really sleep. <laughs> because I speak loud. So, so I hope uh, I'm not doing like that. So if anyone wants to sleep in this lecture, I'm not going to give any lecture, so don't worry. And it is my really privilege, I would say, and my pleasure too, that you know the students, and the, uh, three of them, if I'm not wrong, they are undergrad students. If I'm, uh, if, uh, am I wrong? Uh, you're, you're undergrad? Uh, yeah. Okay, just, uh, I think you also just, you just, just graduated, okay. So marginal uh, effect is there still. Uh, but they have, they are presenting papers, three papers on three different issues. Uh, I think this is something we should really feel proud of. And uh, I look forward to their presentations. And of course, I'm glad that Saima, Dirisha, she is here to discuss uh, on these three papers. So let's hear from uh, them. First is Sema, Ms. Sema Brahman, uh, student uh, at the university. Yes, please. So, how much time do they have? Mm, Ten minutes each? Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. I'm Seema Rahman from the University of Dhaka. Today, I'm honored to present my paper here, and I thank Sanam for giving me this opportunity. Now, the title of my paper is Asking Preparedness of Digital Transport Infrastructure for Regional Economic Cooperation in South Asia. Today's world order decrees that trade facilitation and regional economic integration are important factors, important factors for creating an ecosystem for shared prosperity. If you look at the state of inter-regional trade all around the world, we can say that Europe is quite integrated in case of this because 60% of their trade is inter-regional, whereas in case of East Asia and Southeast Asia, the figures are 35% and 25% respectively. If we look at our very own backyard, we can see the uh, we can see that the figure is less than 5%. And this makes South Asia a disconnected region because, for example, we can say although the distance between India and Brazil is more than 14,000 kilometers. It's 20% cheaper for India to trade with Brazil rather than trading with Pakistan. Now, now, increases in trade are possible with the implementation of various transport integration efforts. The promising Asian highway network and transition railway network, which spans from the Pacific coast to the Mediterranean, can link South Asia and the world. The proposed BCI and economic corridor has the potential to revolutionize production network. The motor vehicle agreement between Bangladesh, Bhutan, India and Nepal is another landmark effort to integrate the region. Now, what is LPI and what is BCI? LPI is a summary indicator of a country's performance index 
performance in the logistics sector where the quality of freight and transport infrastructure is one of the six core components. And in case of GPI, it, it's another competitive measure for national infrastructure quality published by World Economic Forum since 2004, where infrastructure is one of the 12 main pillars. Both of these are survey based, that's why they don't focus solely on the current state of digital transport infrastructure of any country. Now, moving on to the literature review of my paper, at first I'm going to talk about UNICEF's 2014 annual case study titled Regional Connectivity for Shared Prosperity. It says that the contribution of hard infrastructure to development is dependent on soft infrastructure. A landmark study by Spires Bobius of the University of Nottingham stated that hard infrastructure is regarded as a cost reducing technology, which in turn increases the trade opportunities. Lima and Velas in their 1999 study said that one uh, said that the uh, impact of infrastructure in case of transport cost and bilateral trade cost is very important. By the very same author in an excellent report in 2001, they remarked that whole infrastructure is responsible for 40% of transport costs for coastal countries, whereas the figure goes up to 60% in case of landlocked countries. M. Ramotul in 2010 said that the logistic cost in South Asia is very high. It's 13 to 14 percent of the GDP in South Asia, where it is only 8 percent in USA. Putting emphasis on the South and Southwest Asian countries' participation in the global value chain, Pravid Bay in 2014 concluded that poor state of the hard and soft infrastructure is one of the main reasons the involvement in the chain is so underpar for the respective countries. Now, I have come to the research question of my paper, and it is whether the digital transport infrastructure of South Asia is sufficiently developed for meeting the prerequisites for a regionally integrated trade. For this, I have accessed my data from WDI, that means World Development Indicators, and also from United Nations Economic and Social Commission and for Asian Pacific Statistical Database. I think now I have reached to the most interesting part of my paper. For assessing the preparedness of each country, here I have come up with a new idea that is to make, a, make an index namely the individual connectivity scorecard. And it has uh, individual connectivity scorecard. Now, what's the idea of this scorecard? I'm back to let you know that this scorecard is designed to assign a numerical value for any country selected, a score that will reflect the current state of development of physical transport infrastructure of that particular country. By now, I think a question has not in your mind, in everyone's mind, that which variables to include in this. Well, initially six relevant variables were taken, and there are four indicators, road, rail, aviation, and port infrastructure, and these are divided into six components, road density, rail density, rail freight, air freight, passengers carried by air, and finally, container port traffic. A revision has been run to see which of these components have a significant or uh, stinging effect on the total trade. Here, apart from the six components that I've mentioned earlier, here I have used GDP, investment, and tax on international trade, and a panel data for 35 countries spanning over 20 years, and that is 1990 to 2011 was used here. As we can see, the revision results, and uh, four of the six components were found significant, and these are road density, rail density, container port traffic, and rail freight, and these four variables are now are going to be calculated in my scorecard. Uh, the values are standardized initially by using the formula variable E is equal to actual value minus minimum value divided by maximum value minus minimum value. We all know that a similar formula is used for calculating AJ as well. After the standardization, each component gets a score between 0 to 100, and then the scores of each component are added up to get the final individual score of a country. Needless to mention, the individual score is on a scale of 0 to 400. Now, what is the minimum, maximum, and actual value? In case of minimum and maximum value, it's the lowest and highest score uh, 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 value scored by any country for the particular variable, and the real value is the actual value scored by any country for the particular variable and for the reference here. Here we can see the list for the individual score card for selected countries. We can see that China has topped the list with a score of 220.88, and Japan is second to China with a score of 134.49. Our country Bangladesh is at the 8th position with a score of 78.12 and we can see Myanmar is at the last position with a score of 0 0.67. To check whether the individual scorecard is a good representative of the hard infrastructure of a country, here I have run another regression 
and this classification uh, I have in, in, instead of using the six components I have used the initial scorecard as a separate and as a as a variable as a whole and it was found significant one percent of the significance and uh, looking at the size of the coefficient we can say an increase in the initial scorecard will eventually lead to an increase in the total set of the sample. Here from the map, uh, I, I have just uh, I have just mentioned the countries of South India, and as mentioned earlier, we can see Bangladesh is at the eighth position with a score of 78.12, and in case of South India, the highest position is of India with a score of 106.06, and Nepal is uh, uh, Nepal is at the position 29th position with a score of 2.2. Now, India appears to be well prepared in terms of transport, uh, transport infrastructure. Its geographical positioning, making it a common look throughout the region, can help regional integration. Given that political reconciliation among the countries are ensured, is ensured, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, while having room for improvement, they are relatively well placed. But what about the land of countries like Nepal and Bhutan? They are not in a good soil, we can say, from the religious token. And I think it's a uh, 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 there is no rail network in Bhutan and Nepal as well. This also uh, ha had an impact on my poker. Okay. Now, uh, uh, I, I guess if, if people remember the question of my paper was if the countries are prepared for, uh, for further integration trade, uh, for further trading integration, for the integration region, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for that. Okay, uh, now looking onto the two major regional transport integration schemes and asking the preparedness of those, you can say that in case of BVIN, that means the motor vehicle agreement, Bangladesh India is in satisfactory level and unsatisfactory level is in, uh, in the unsatisfactory scheme where it's Nepal and Bhutan. In case of this and economic corridor, apart from Myanmar, Bangladesh, India and China are in a satisfactory condition. So what are the applications of this scorecard? After giving a summary view, we can see the trend. Here I have used the data for 2011 for con uh, conducting this scorecard, but if we get, can get the scores for the more countries, we can see the trend and the scorecard can be used to get a succinct comparison analysis among countries. I have come up with a new idea of uh, making the bilateral country scorecard as well, and this will show, uh, the bilateral country scorecard will show the uh, mutual countries in index between pair of nations. And here I'm going to use the Indian country scorecards and the shared land ports, airports, and sea seaports along with the transit agreements that have taken place always take place in the future. What are the further scopes for this research? The methodology can be applied in calculating the scorecards for worldwide regional blocks and groups of adjacent nations. Summary scores can Summary scores can be utilized as key data in socioeconomic studies in order to exert correlations between trade, connectivity, and overall development indicators. Now, I am moving to the takeaways, and uh, as an overall summary, I can say China was on top of the list with a score of 225.88 out of 400, and Myanmar with, was with a lower score, and three of the 45 countries are landlocked. And the last one is apart from India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, all the five nations perform poorly. In conclusion, this exercise gives us a few insights that multimodal transport facilities for land of nations is of paramount importance. For this, cross-national planning should be undertaken for region-wide infrastructure development and for that, exploring non-traditional sources of funds can be an option. Thank you all and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you so much. I think you an excellent presentation, uh, especially the topic she was presenting is as a kind of complicated and then also uh, but very topical because now we all talk about uh, uh, trade facilitation when it to promote international trade or global trade. Thank you, Samad. Now the next uh, presenter is uh, Mr. Azrafuddin Ahmad from the Black University. He will be talking on Good evening. Um, so when we initially started this study, our initial question was quite simple. We wanted to reflect on the experience that Bangladesh has with combating income inequality. Because if we really want to make our economy inclusive to all, it's something that we need to eventually deal with. But 
the point at which we started looking into inequality, we realized that um, the experience that we Bangladeshi have that uh, our institutions being largely <coughs> corruption ridden and unable to deal with uh, the demands of com combating inequality is not an excuse which is universal to all. Um, because inequality has been risen so much in developed and developing countries, it's become some, somewhat of a hot button issue in economic spheres. Uh, so, what has emerged from the discussion around inequality is that there are like largely two views. One view proposes that in, uh, proposes that inequality is something that happens as a result of uh, the structure of capitalism because our economies work in the way that they do. Uh, inequality is promoted. Uh, Ricardo, Marx, and most recently Thomas Piketty have been trying to explain why inequality happens through promoting general laws or models which explain how inequality happens. This view that this train of thought takes argues that it's when our economies function efficiently, that's when inequality is happening. In contrast, what we see more in Bangladesh and in developing countries is that institutional makeup and the various political power adjustments which happen is something that leads to inequality, be it the failure of institutions to work or their design particularly. So what we were interested in was the question of whether or not it's the functioning of uh, capitalism within developing countries, is, is that what it leads to inequality or is it rather our institutional failures to control it and maybe compare between these two examples. Um, so we first wanted to look at uh, corruption initiatives, as I mentioned. So the first thing that we looked at was like how corruption can affect inequality. And it, whether or not it does, it really depends on the definition you take. So authors like Rose Ackerman, who define corruption as like the sale of public assets and services to private individuals, if you take that view, corruption obviously increases inequality because certain groups get access to certain public assets which they otherwise should not be doing. But in contrast, Kaufman and Wade view corruption as something which is more of a social loop as a lubricant, which enables individuals to access services which they otherwise could not in countries with poor institutions. So the effect of corruption might be growth enhancing and may make economies more inclusive for a lot of people. So over here, there's some degree of uncertainty as to what the effect of uh, corruption on inequality is, as well as its nature. So uh, initially, individuals had the impression that corruption affected growth and inequality linearly. However, um, Rizu and Zhao have found out that uh, corruption really affects these things non-linearly and has a quadratic relationship, um, where they find that high and low levels of corruption lead to uh, low inequality, while intermediate levels of uh, corruption lead to high inequality. Uh, but the problem uh, that we found within existing literature is that the vast majority of empirical studies conducted into the matter largely dealt with a set of developed countries while the literature really did not uh, analyze what's happening within the developing countries. So we thought it would be worthwhile to extend upon it. The second thing that we found was problematic was that uh, the fact that inequality and corruption are largely endogenous. So inequality also causing corruption because people perceive that systems are unfair and don't really work and it's not being incentivized to actually corrupt ways. So that's another issue that we found that the literature could have been addressed. The second component of our paper wanted to look at the functioning of capitalism. So we took uh, the recent discussion by Thomas Piketty uh, as a starting point, where, and we utilized this second fundamental law. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, the, uh, on a very fundamental level, he argues that the uh, ratio between capital and income in the long run is equal to the ratio between savings and growth in the economy, and the capital share of national income is the real returns of capital into the capital income uh, ratio. And so he combines these two expressions uh, in the long term, suggests that the capital income ratio uh, is R into S by E. The implication of this is, is that the, if the real returns of capital over the long term grow faster than the economy is growing, those who already have access to capital will have increasing shares of national income and thus inequality will spiral in the long run. Now, this, uh, he, he analyzed this using a long range of historical data, and it's become somewhat of a, like a controversial issue in this economics. Many economists such as Crossell and Smith, uh, Galbraith, and Asimov and Robinson have criticized various facets of their model. Some have criticized the, his uh, assumption of constant savings rate, which we try and control for within our uh, regression separately to move out of that. Uh, some have uh, questioned whether or not uh, real returns to capital are as uh, directly attributable, attributable to their owners because of taxation, something else that we additionally uh, control for. So our objectives are to build on the existing literature on the effects of corruption on inequality and extend this to developing countries while dealing within the indigenous idea and also to test the validity of Piketty's R minus G or second fundamental law. The key variables of interest that we wanted to look at was inequality as our dependent variable where we use the Gini coefficient. 
The reason that we chose the Gini coefficient is because of the broad coverage it offers as opposed to other measures such as stock decile income shares, which most countries don't really report. For corruption, we utilize the corruption perception index where we uh, transform the 0 to 10 scale to a 0 to 100 scale for ease of uh, interpretation. But the uh, most crucial part was how do we how do we define real recurrency capital? See, PKT uses a historical average. However, uh, once we try and expand our data set to include more developing countries, such information isn't necessarily readily available. So what we do is we use real interest rates as a proxy to measure re recurrence of capital as uh, similarly as done in the action of the world in some cases. The vast majority of our data is collated from yeah. World Bank sources and uh, their governance uh, characteristics. Um, the methodology that we use is uh, two-stage p-score regression because in order to deal with the NHLIT, we're using instrument variables. We additionally use time dummies, country level clustering, and also control for serial correlation to deal with the various methodologies that we use. We use included square term. And for, and for our regression, where we try and examine the second fundamental law, where we have the R minus G variable, we interact uh, that with corruption because we want to see how the effect of return to capital uh, affects inequality at various institutional levels. And we also use quantile regressions to look at uh, the effects of these two variables on inequality at various levels of inequality. What we wanted to stress upon was the uh, role of endogeneity, because this is something that we feel that hasn't been dealt with in literature quite adequately. Because most uh, studies have focused on corruption and growth, where they use things like democracy and uh, uh, colonial history, which don't really work because those affect inequality directly. We rather use three variables. We use regulatory quality, which is just a measure of how well regulations govern the businesses and individuals. Government effectiveness, which is a measure of government bureaucracy and how effectively the government can enact its various policies. And government fractionalization, which looks at uh, the probability that two individuals drawn at random from a public office are from of two different political sources. The more bureaucratic government offices are, the more incentives individuals have to be corrupt, and also um, the more loopholes it can find in regulations, the more that they, they can act in corrupt manners. So the crucial thing here to note is, is that it satisfies the exclusion restriction because poor regulations and bureaucracy enable individuals to act in corrupt manner. So the effect of these variables on inequality happens through the channel of corruption. One may argue that government effectiveness does affect um, things like growth and tax collection and can affect inequality as well. So what we did is that we control for these variables separately in addition to other macroeconomic variables to inhibit these effects so to ensure that we meet the uh, exclusion restriction. Of so what did we find? We found that corruption is a significant determinant of inequality and that inequality initially rises with corruption, but it starts falling after a turning point of 64.4. What does this mean in practical terms? For a country like Bangladesh, which has a corruption perception index score of uh, 27 or 28, it, it means that in order for uh, inequality to decline with, uh, as our country gets cleaner, it has to become as clean as Estonia. So um, what we also find is that in the short term, for both developed and developing countries, that our energy or the difference between real returns to uh, capital and growth is significant, suggesting that uh, Pekiti's hypothesis that uh, returns to capital significantly affect inequality, it holds to even after we control for institutional features such as corruption. However, the interaction between the two is not significant, and crucially, both of these variables are strongly uh, significant after at very, very high levels of inequality, as we show in our quantile regression. Uh, I want to draw attention to the fact that our uh, wild stats and the RKF while their stats are uh, quite high relative to the stock and yield critical value, suggesting that our choice of instruments are strong enough to make a regression uh, efficient. As, as I mentioned previously, that at very, very high levels of inequality, both corruption and arm issues fail to explain the vast majority of the rises in inequality. So beyond the 80th percentile, we see that uh, this, their explanatory power diminishes. Um, before we move on to the conclusions, I'd like to point out a few limitations and how we chose to deal with that. Uh, First of all, uh, there's a lack of regular time period data on education because most of that is collected through censuses which offer at three years or five year intervals in most countries. So what we did is that we took three year averages of our data and included education data from uh, various population census. And we found that our results don't really change all that much, or not at all. So we found that our uh, results are robust to that. Uh, another thing that um, individuals might argue is that Gini is largely synthetic and vague and does not give a structural look at Inequality. So for a limited set of countries from our panel, 
uh, we ran uh, the result, our same regression with top decide income spheres, and we found that corruption still affected inequality, but RMLG did not in some specific cases. Um, can I just have one more minute? Okay, that one. And lastly, um, because we use real interest rates, uh, it might not fully capture the return to capital in developed countries where financial markets are far more developed. So to see if our uh, variables also capture the effect of real returns, in developed countries, we ran our set of regressions separately for developed nations in order to see if the effects were similar, and we found that uh, the results were largely consistent. So what conclusions can we draw from this? That we can draw the conclusion that combating corruption can be a major step in reducing the level of inequality that we have in developing countries. However, the scale of improvement that is necessary might be out of reach in the immediate short term for countries like Bangladesh, until, unless some major institutional changes happen. But the main issue here is, is that Given that returns to capital do have short-term effects, we can also use efficient taxes on capital to, to combat inequality, provided that we can find the necessary political uh, motivation to uh, raise these taxes. But in absence of this, we feel that large institutional changes are necessary if we want to prevent inequality from spiral, spiraling and having very serious negative consequences. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And hope you uh, uh, I'm in front. And it's, it's really an excellent presentation, I would say. And then I, I think that uh, this presentation could easily be picked into yesterday's uh, session of the politics as well. Uh, despite that, you are a student, but I'm really impressed. Thank you. Uh, this, uh, but there are two questions, probably, uh, you can think of it while you answer the one is that uh, I'll just ask you about the time period, which you also diversified your panel. Uh, and then, uh, when you talk about the real interest rate and the property of return to capital, in many of the developing countries, actually, maybe the return to capital, because of the informality and the kind of, uh, because maybe of the corruption, the rate is much higher than what you show the real interest rate. Uh, now we come to our third uh, presenter, Ms. Tahia uh, Hira, uh, from the Department of Economics at the University. We will be talking on impact of institution barriers to decision to serve its trade, comparing South Asia to the world. Good evening, everyone. Today, I'm really honored that I have given the opportunity to present my paper in this grand event. Um, the title of my paper is Institutional Barriers and Potential for Trading Services in South Asia, compared to the world. Um, Trading services drives technology and exchange of ideas. Service trade is nowadays one of the strongest ingredients for integration of nations and for regional growth as well. For trade negotiators, service trade liberalization is now one of the top agendas in both market design and budget regulation. General agreements in, um, on trade and services under WTO is considered as framework in negotiating service trade liberalization in market design region. The growing behavior of service trade sector has contributed more to the GDPs of South Asian nations recently. Relatively better performance of South Asian service trade is um, mainly seen from the last decade and policy reforms and deregulations, though all the pain a very big role here, but however South Asia still faces transitions in this regard and it has a long way to go. Um, the objective of my, of my paper was to, at the first was to examine service trade behavior with barriers and restrictions among countries and the second was to compare South, South Asian service trade behavior with the world. And um, I have gone through a lot of literature, and um, um, my methodology is, is uh, somehow different from them. And uh, I can I am mentioning uh, some a uh, few major researches uh, from them. The large part of South Asian service trade is done informally. These are high regulations and trade barriers suggested by Oriental money and projected movements in 2014. Close to labor exporting is one of the major impediments of service trade in South Asia. Was suggested by Dupatanda in 2011. Ethan and Horn suggested services are special as they are customized to meet the needs of individuals for children. Dan Hans Shepard in 2007 said it is useful to disaggregate the sector wise trade restrictiveness indexes by modes. And uh, so far, the literature says that there are four modes studied. The first mode is cross border supply, which uh, includes that the supply of country uh, services supplied from the supply of country to the consumer's country. And the second mode is consumption abroad, that includes that the consumer moves to the supplier's country. Mode 3 is commercial prison, that is, a service at a foreign, uh, a service is traded at a foreign based establishment in consumer's country. And 4 is 
The movement of natural person, that is, a third person is moving with a service from the surprise country to the consumer country. Uh, that is that is so in type. Uh, panel data of one twenty one eighty five countries was uh, selected for five years from two thousand ten to two thousand fourteen. Data for total annual service rate, per capita GDP, rural effective exchange rate, mode of movement in secondary education, population density per square kilometer, uh, were taken from uh, the World Development Indicator from World Bank. Uh, overall, the space to frontier DPS value was taken from Green Figures Indicator from World Bank. World Bank and service rate restriction uh, database SCRI index was used. From development economic research group of world bank. Uh, the my, my methodology, methodology consists of two parts. The first part is the panel model, and the second is the cross section model. Uh, the panel model, uh, in the panel model, my focus very will work uh, distance to frontier index. And that is um, a, a value to determine the absolute level of developer's performance over time. The higher the DDF value, the better to the, is the performance of a nation in lessening the barriers, and the lower the DDF value, the better the, the, the opposite. And the regression model looks like this, uh, where the eight, um, given the number of variables in the total annual service rate as a weekly export, export and import in the double form, and the expansion uh, variable, variables are overall DPS, part of the GDP in current US dollars, where the exchange rate from current US dollar, net enrollment in secondary education, and um, the, uh, after running the global uh, regression, I have introduced uh, South Asian dollar. A dummy variable, um, which, uh, which is one for Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Maldives, and for BSA for uh, countries except these seven. Uh, my cross section model also uh, includes uh, two regressions. Uh, first one is a global uh, regression where the focus variable is CRI, service rate restriction index, where the value ranges from 0 to 100, where 0 is completely open and 100 is completely closed. High value expresses higher restrictions, and lower value expresses the uh, just opposite. So it is considered to uh, take the negative value and the uh, negative position uh, while uh, while random is the regression with the service rate. And the um, regression uh, here the dependent variable is trading services percentage of GDP over time and overall SCRI per capita GDP in current US dollar population density per per kilometer. And um, then I have introduced again a salvation dummy where the dummy variable is one for Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan, and zero for countries other than me. I couldn't include uh, Maldives and Bhutan for this uh, regression because SCRI value was not uh, available for those countries. <coughs> the empirical findings. Uh, at first, I ran a full OLS uh, and uh, then I thought that uh, it's a panel model and I ran a random model. Uh, I suspected for human elasticity and I placed it with, with, with robust standard error and I ran a GLS model. And as I uh, included a dummy variable, so I uh, went for a mid square dummy variable model too. And as you can see that the, uh, all the uh, coefficients are uh, almost same for three to four <coughs> decimal level. Uh, but the uh, significant level improves when I use this for dummy variable. The variables are significant having coefficient signs consistent with priority. The coefficient of overall DPS is positive as higher DPS values show that restrictions resulting higher was not paid. As the overall DPS value increases by one, service rate improves by 1.8% on average. Holdings are the king's constant. South Asian dummy is significant, suggesting that the world has been displaced the various South Asia being um, better than the world. That is, um, so the percentage of service rate increases more in South Asia compared to the world. Uh, then the level uh, from a cross section study. Uh, here um, I can see that, that the uh, variable, the signs of the variables are um, uh, okay with my consistency uh, with my researcher. But the thing is that this variable, the, the South Asian dummy is in the link to the here. The variables are significant with expected signs consistent with the researcher. Overall, SCI variable is significant with negative position indicating that the, in, uh, the increase in restrictions of which I value the base. Well, SCI increases by 1. Trading services persistence of, uh, percentage of GDP decreases by 0.12 units on average, holding other things constant. The South Asian dummy is insignificant, suggesting for specifically in 2015, there was no major difference in South Asian countries' relationship between SCRI and trading services. Analytical finding the study uh, finds travel services with an anticipation and the that is, the total amount of service rate moves negatively with restriction. And for South Asia, the relationship is quite significant. Uh, when various are lowered, South Asian GDP grows more than the non South Asian nation. Here is a classical presentation. Uh, from uh, the, uh, from 1975 to uh, 2013, 
with the data of training services person is GDP over time, where the blue line is for world and the red line is for South Asia. We can see that the, from the middle of the last decade, the South Asian survey trade has surpassed the gold line and it's um, just um, going to have a From 1975 to 2004, the service trade share of GDP has risen from 6% to 12.9% for the world, while the South Asian service trade share of GDP has risen from 2% to 30.08% in this year. Um, service traders are particularly liberal growth, domestic product growth, and helping to the growth of the same economy. And uh, here I have I'm presenting a presentation for the API um, values in South Asia. Uh, we can see that the um, values are for Bangladesh, India, Liberal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, and the values are for overall um, mode 1, mode 3, and mode 4. And we can see that the, all the values are um, extremely high for the countries here, especially Bangladesh and India is um, having a really high value of restriction. And Sri Lanka is um, losing uh, less in overall, but more poor countries uh, has a uh, Sri Lanka has uh, the highest value in more poor, and uh, more poor in Pakistan too. But uh, um, but in overall more uh, I think India has the uh, largest restriction here in service trade. And South Asia, uh, I'm concluding. The South Asia uh, uh, Asian service trade has grown more than the most non-South Asian countries. Though the service trade has emerged as a major growth driver in South Asia for the last decade, South Asian nations have not yet shown much progress in displaying domestic populations and other barriers. Vocational and technical training programs should remain regardless to develop new measures and make region more much strong competing with the non-South Asian nations in trading services. And last of all, I should say that the government should work hand in hand and build trust to display barriers and encourage service trade in South Asia to foster economic growth and integration of nations. Thank you. Thank you, I think so excellent. Uh, because uh, your paper actually uh, showed us that the kind of opportunities we have is, uh, to have in the South Asian context when it comes to services trade. And uh, I'm glad that the way you kind of apply the data, we know that the services trade are one of the major problems with the data, especially with respect to the restriction uh, and uh, when, it, when it comes to kind of, you know, for a longer time period. So I'm, I'm really glad to see this uh, kind of reflection. Also, I can recall Simap's presentation on the trade fund solution. Both these two papers could easily fit into our trade fund trade uh, session yesterday. Because I, I can really see the kind of the, uh, the work they have done. It's a very solid empirical work. We can, we can disagree with the kind of the methodology. We can try out them to improve on the methodology. But I'm really pleased to see the kind of effort they have put, uh, you know, uh, to make this paper the, the kind of analytical uh, findings you are getting it out of this uh, these two papers. Thank you so much, these three paper presenters. Uh, I think now uh, we move to the discussion. Uh, Dr. Simon, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure for me. Uh, because uh, all three papers uh, are really very interesting and um, talked about very pertinent issues. And uh, as Dr. Rahan said, that I'm also very impressed about the quality of the work. And uh, I think uh, all these papers have the potential to get published in good journal. Uh, uh, now, uh, the thing is, um, for, uh, for the third paper, let me start with the first, uh, third paper. Uh, maybe you can uh, do a, uh, give a little bit of justification of why you're using random asset model. Uh, that is one thing uh, you know, I, I was just looking for. Uh, another thing is like uh, when you are uh, doing this analysis, one thing was not very clear because you have a cross sectional model and you have a panel model. Uh, and uh, when you are using the depend uh, dependent variables, those also differ. So this is something uh, I'm not very sure about the justification <coughs> why you are using these two type of models. So maybe uh, uh, maybe when you are presenting, it would be good if you give some justification on that, so um, you know, the viewers can be uh, can relate with that. Uh, another thing is like. Uh, for the, uh, for the structure of the paper, this is something, uh, I think your paper's thing is like, uh, you have put the descriptives at the end, and you have put the economic risk in the beginning. So this is something like, uh, I would say that you start with the motivation, you give some descriptives, 
then you go into the econometric detail because econometric should come after looking at the descriptor. So this is something that uh, that is like the regarding the structure. Uh, another thing is like uh, so when you are talking about uh, the explanatory variables, uh, I have a feeling that some of the variables, uh, for example, education. Uh, these variables like why you selected and why you selected these specific education variables, this is not very clear. So maybe you can, uh, how you can improve the model. Uh, one thing you can do with the uh, econometric modeling, random assessment, all of the things. And uh, another thing is like you can double check with the, with the, with the variables, explanatory variables that you have included. And, um, and there should be proper justification and proper literature backup for including the variables. That is one thing. For example, um, I have a feeling that these uh, 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 the variables that you have chosen, these are uh, more or less related to more macro type of variables. So uh, I would be interested to see more on trade related variables. So that is something maybe uh, that would shed more light into the area. Uh, another um, final comment is like when you're using like random effect, GLS, and it's a random variable, uh, the results are more or less close, but uh, you should have one particular model which you think the most preferred model. So this is not very clear which model actually you are preferring. Generally, what we do, we generally list all our results, and then we select one particular variable, one particular model, uh, based on some justification, based on some econometric sophistication. So, uh, because at least the coefficients and some of the uh, significance can also the coefficient difference. So, this is something that we have tried to do, uh, but overall, I think it's a very interesting model. Uh, now, the second one. Uh, the paper, obviously it's a very interesting paper. Uh, basically, I must admit that uh, I'm more uh, related to a person uh, who works with um, data. So uh, uh, the thing is that the paper that I, I had, uh, uh, that is at the tables. So it was a little bit problematic for me because I was not able to look at the coefficients very clearly. So it would be very good if, if I can have the, the a proper uh, paper, full paper before that. Uh, so, but uh, my two uh, co quick comments is like uh, the paper, the motivation part looks too long. So, uh, it is good when you are uh, giving it to a journal, but journals have definitely have some restriction in the word limit. So, so uh, when you are, uh, uh, when I was reading your paper, it seems that you are talking about the background literature, which is very good. But I think uh, <coughs> it can have the problem of people can get like a dis uh, distracted. So that is one uh, one point. Like this is the same thing like the organizational issue when you will uh, try to improve the paper. Uh, the second point that because I have not able to see the econometric level, the second point was uh, uh, related to uh, the the point in fact that you mentioned in your limitation uh, that when you're using the Gini coefficient, Gini coefficient. So we always talk about how uh, how representative Gini is when we are talking about Gini coefficient. Because this is another thing is like uh, I don't know whether you can use some variable which type of variable in your analysis in order to capture more broader dimension. Uh, another point is about uh, I think you have chosen the quick select based on the half guess. Uh, I, I always think that it's it's good to have the random to present the random model as well, just to compare and just to cross check and how these two differ. Because uh, in many of the cases we find that when we do the analysis, the results come in favor of the uh, system. Uh, another small point is about the score curve. Um, uh, uh, have you adjusted for the responsive units? If you have adjusted the response. So that is one thing, and uh, in the scorecard, um, for example, I know we have seen that India has a very large value. Uh, China has a very large value. Russia has a very large value. So by any chance, 
Also, try to think, think of submitting those papers in the journals or you know, in, our, in other different publications. And I, I really thank you to Dr. Gidisha for a very, very, very useful comments. So now the floor is open. Uh, question uh, uh, I will come back to later. Yes. First, I give the opportunities to Robert to give the questions first. Um, okay, please at the back. Yes. Thank you, sir. Um, I am Mr. Rizai Rabbi, a student uh, of Economic Department, Hack University. I have a question to Ms. Zira. You said that you have a conclusion that the barriers will be reduced by the government. The government has been in the South Asia, and the government has been in the South Asia. The recent year of TARC really is a flop space for South Asia. And TARC is one of the countries so much for your understanding. I'm not sure whether you understood what he said. He said that whether whether is there any SAR, whether it's what it's working or not. You know, so in that context, what should we do for the vision? Yes, Ramesh, you want to ask something? Yes, please. Let me, at the outset, uh, congratulate all the students for their excellent work and uh, the fact that a lot of econometrics is used. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there are certain things that you can incorporate for making it sure that uh, it gets published in a good way. For example, a paper on a panel which used uh, time series data, now uh, if you send it to the journal, all the evaluators will like to will like you to test all panel unit rule sets. So uh, that is something that we have to do because you said panel to SLS. If you use panel, then you have to uh, uh, show us the random effect and the fixed effect, and then uh, it's not only it's random versus fixed, then it is pooled versus fixed. So there are different tests, Hoffman and uh, the rest test. So that is one. Uh, uh, more importantly, you know, this unit root thing has to be checked. And say if you have a unit root problem, then what is it? So one is I1, another is I0. So then you end up doing channel ARD. And if all are I1, then you end up with panel policy. So the work has now really started uh, because we have to check for that. But I have my doubt whether it is panel or simultaneous equation. If it is simultaneous equation, then uh, there are other sets of issues like the endogeneity problem. Uh, that, that we, so you have to go back and check whether it is uh, simultaneous equation because you are trying to connect inequality with with corruption and then you say it's a two SLS. So you must have got corruption and you must have regressed it on all the observations <coughs> you got and predicted value and then you must have put it. So I have my doubt whether it is panel or it is simultaneous. So if it is simultaneous, you have both endogenous and exogenous variables. If it is panel then it's only exogenous variables that you start with. So that's my one so it's a silly my little uh, you, could, you should have given them more than 10 minutes. The poor lot, they had to finish everything in 10 minutes. You have to eat yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, 
Uh, no, thank you. I think uh, one of this clarification, probably I can find this from Ashwagandha, uh, that uh, my observation is that to run the panel uh, unit route, you need kind of reasonably long time data. So uh, that's something they, they can clarify whether the time period was sufficient enough to run any panel unit route or panel configuration. Yes, yes please. Uh, I'll come back to you later. Okay, first I give the opportunity to school. I'm Abdullah Mimon from Development of Economics University Data. My question is to Father Fatin Ahmad. Uh, in your paper conclusions, you recommended uh, that uh, about uh, imposing taxes on capital efficiency. And can you elaborate with, uh, with this which way strategy uh, this can be happened to limit corruption prevention? Yes. Uh, uh, yes, please. She has come from Sharjah University and uh, not give her a hand. I'm not going to ask you. Not honestly, but uh, you are also a little channel. So they have come for just for this conference. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm Mr. Arjahusin Ahmed. I'm Mr. Kursi Kursi Kursi. I'm Mr. Ahmed. I'm Mr. Kursi 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 Kursi. So, I'm Mr. Kursi 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 so, এখানে আপনি কত সাল থেকে ডাটা জানা নেওয়া শুরু করেছেন এবং কত সাল পর্যন্ত এবং হচ্ছে এই যে ডাটাগুলো ইউজ করছেন সবগুলো ডাটা কি কন্টিনিউয়াস মানে আপনি সবগুলো ডাটা কি পেয়েছেন আর আর হচ্ছে আপনি এখানে 69 কান্ট্রি যেহেতু নিয়েছেন এখানে হচ্ছে হাই ইনকাম লো ইনকাম আপার মিডল লো মিডল ইনকাম কান্ট্রি মানে ফাইভ টাইপস অফ গ্রুপস অফ কান্ট্রিজ আছে এখানে ইনিকুয়ালিটি এন্ড করাপশন এই দুইটার মধ্যে যে রিলেশনশিপটা আপনি দেখেছেন এটা কি সব কান্ট্রির জন্যই মানে ফাইভ গ্রুপস অফ কান্ট্রির জন্যই নাকি মানে একদম স্পেসিফিক সাউথ এশিয়ান কান্ট্রিজ অর ইস্টি অর আদার টাইপস অফ কান্ট্রি थैंक यू वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन मेड आंसर टू दिस क्वेश्चंस ऑफ कोर्स एनी अदर हैंड हियर्स ओके प्लीज यस First of all, I'd like to congratulate Sadhya to give opportunity to this young people and me because it reminds me when we have the Commonwealth Youth Minister Conference. UN General Assembly President as the I was only 20, but I was the lead speaker. So it encouraged me that you please give more opportunity, both female and young. Then my question, especially to the, about the physical transport infrastructure for regional economic consensus. I think most of the data has come after 2011. But so far with the media and others, you know, that the many things develop a lot. In, in that direction, what do you think? How you see the future? How it is going on? And last but not least, that in the two days conference, we learned a lot. Many, many thanks to Sanan for hospitality, everything, an excellent conference. Thank you. Kuno prashno hai, chudo kani ek tu ohi rutti pakat kora. Aaj ke doh din jabo, is thane mein rutto ke je pray poon orna session. Aato shundar babu hai se, aato gustu poon aato chala hai se. Abo mera entertainment. Reje abhi koto koi pose orthanti shomiti saha, irukom shundar aato chala shundar babusta apna sab kichu aato ka dinashi babu. Selim Rahma, Selim Rahman, I want to ask him here. There are so many questions and David are a lot of questions. We have to take a mobile phone call. Ah, I have to tell you that I am Chaitanya Bhutra. I have to take a class in the classic model. I have to take a class in the classic model. I have to take a class in the classic model. I have to take a class in the classic model. I have to take a class in the classic model. I have to take a class in the classic model. अतः ये चीज़ ना सेपरेट प्रेजेंट करते हैं शर्ट शर्ट भी क्या है तारा बादिंग रिसर्च सर हमारे देश के नॉर्थ यार भूजों तारा पुश भी तो है कि सर अब हम तारा उस पर तो माने आगे देखें हमारा गोरमेंट में कुछ भी जो है ये भी आता है कि आगे अभी तारे के दोनों बात जाना चाहिए तारे तो शेखों का नहीं बोलते सवाई के ठंगों वाले शॉप पर मौ कुलाहाल नफल यावोचार एवं निशंदाय जनों तुम्हारे आवाज़ शॉप पर मौ जब कहूँ 
uh, Thokar uh, until he Inna played. Po. And the latest one was Sitam Dragon. Uh, that is their song with Mr. Stepler that I think. And uh, I po. think they are the, uh, the subscription possible in the Inna mode Inna. of transport and the people speak in a macroeconomic environment and have an impact on this and this might change the future prospect of my program. Sorry, I had to like uh, rush over the methodology section a bit in order to finish all of the time. Uh, the question regarding time to use data. Uh, so, we did con conduct panel unit group tests uh, in order to see if the data was stationary or not, and we found that the data was stationary. In addition, what we wanted to see if there was any causality. So, we conducted a greater causality test to see if. Uh, uh, corruption was actually affecting the inequality and the direction was correct. So uh, it did show that corruption was the root cause of inequality and the other way around. Um, in terms of choosing our model, we used the uh, Munma uh, test, which is robust to uh, heteroscedasticity to, to choose a fixed effect model. Um, there were some questions regarding the data set and the time period. We used the data set of, from 2000 to 2011. Initially, it was supposed to be longer, but since the uh, Transparency International, they changed the methodology for calculating. CPI, we had to limit it to 2011. Um, the data was indeed continuous um, and did cover a variety of countries. So, uh, about from 69, about uh, about 40 ish were developing countries, uh, not only from this region but globally, and the rest were uh, high income countries from around the world. Um, in addition, uh, a question was raised about uh, the choice of variables. So, um, in terms of returns to capital, yes, real interest rates might underestimate. Uh, the returns to capital, in specifically in light of corruption, but given that this is a downward bias, we think that our result is still preserved. Um, regarding the question about uh, the choice of measure of inequality, uh, we try to test our results with differing measures of inequality, so uh, with decile income shares, and found that our results were like uh, con consistent. I can kind of give you a bit of a hand on that. Uh, uh, probably you use that more standardized uh, GD data. Yeah. Uh, salt uh, yeah. is kind of developed, and actually, that whole concern about this, what Dr. Bishaw mentioned, like whether the Gini is truly representative, <laughs> but they actually developed a methodology how we can take into account those things. So, in fact, if you go to salt that world inequality database, <coughs> they have those uh, inequality Gini coefficients are much higher than what uh, Gini coefficients we reported to the world development institutions. Yes, sure. Uh, at first, I want to um, answer my teacher's question. <laughs> well, I know you know what I just wrote. Uh, the first thing is... <laughs> 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 uh, this is the first part of my... Um, I don't know what I And I have to learn uh, all, the, all the variables. And uh, the hard thing was to learn the data function. Everything was the first time for me. And um, the random access model I have learned because I wanted to just compare the signs and positions and everything. And uh, the most preferred model is here, of course, the loop square dynamic variable model. And the random access model uh, bites out the dynamic variable, variable. And that's why MO to me is the most preferred model. I should have mentioned it uh, in my presentation. And uh, the explanatory variables I have taken here um, uh, uh, those are pretty much common in the um, uh, literature. Um, and the thing is, uh, what, what is uncommon is using SCRI as a measure to explain the choosing the different percentage of GDP. Uh, I haven't found this uh, in any literature. Uh, it was the first time I think I uh, I have done this, but the thing is, um, the other explanatory, the central variables are very common in the literature. And, um, uh, uh, I'm answering the question who you are asking. Uh, I'm asking you that uh, you uh, talked about SARC. SARC is for, um, I think, you, you were told that the, the country is uh, integrated with uh, with the with SARC and the data should come from with SARC. You want SARC to be focused, uh, to come for a donation. But you know, SARC loves lag, SARC lags a lot. If you compare it to the European Union and Russia, uh, you, you can compare it with this because uh, the political level, political issues and the 
uh, and many other issues, and you know, the leadership issues, everything else is hating this purpose. And the history, history of this uh, region uh, is, uh, I think uh, they haven't, uh, they, they haven't paid a very good way to integrate it in, in the, you know, the methods or steps of the regional cooperation, and the future regional customs union, common market, economic union, political union, and uh, these things are not happening in here. And I know that this is our failure. That's why I want Spain to make a to, uh, to be connected as a richer, more workable, and more valuable. That's why. Well, the last point, what uh, Vira was making, is something we really want to see from the new generation. I think the old generation in South Asia they could not deliver the sack, uh, what our aspiration was. But the new generation, they should not be really stuck to the kind of conflict or hatred relationship what we had, you know, in between. Uh, I think kind of Tomesh is here. We, we are not having a Pakistan encounter for here, whom we, we could fight here. But uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, India and Pakistan they are fighting, and then that is also being reflected quite a lot in the whole class process. One of my friends, I think I have shared this uh, story with some some of you, but. Maybe not many of you, so I can actually repeat that. Yeah. But the kind of a love and hatred relationship between India and Pakistan was reflected in a place like uh, a husband and a wife, they fought, uh, and then wife left. And then, uh, so after two hours or three hours, wife called back to husband. Uh, what are you doing? Actually, in between what he was doing, uh, when wife left, so there was a photograph of his wife on the on the wall, which was hanging. So the husband went to the kitchen, got a knife, uh, got a knife, and uh, sat on the sofa, and he was throwing that knife to that photo. <laughs> but he couldn't make it, turn it. So every time it misses, he was just picking it up again, putting it back to the sofa, trying his heart, you know, very hard to do that. He couldn't do it. So the wife was so angry because in three hours, four hours, yeah. husband was not calling her back. So then she called, uh, said, what are you doing? Uh, husband said, I'm actually missing. <laughs> so that makes the story, like, you know, the relationship between, actually that story was told by uh, one Pakistani lady in one conference in Delhi. But that is the kind of, the way Pakistan misses India. <laughs> so we, we don't want to miss each other like this. We want to have a unified and very harmony and very peaceful South Asia. With this, I'd like to conclude the session and uh, thank you so much. We'll have a very, very brief uh, concluding session and uh, over to you. Thank you, everyone. Now we, now we move on to our next presenting ceremony. I would like I would like to request the chair, Dr. And to our discussion, uh, Dr. Saima Hoffi. Now, uh, um, we are almost at the end of our second annual economic conference. I would uh, like um, like. Mr. Moshir Rahman and Ms. Uh, Dr. Farazi Deshi to come up on stage for our closing session. Thank you, Dr. Mr. May I now request Dr. Sarma Hafiz to give a
Now we are end of the second panel annual economic conference. Uh, over the last two days, we have heard a lot of uh, interesting ideas and stimulating uh, researches conducted by eminent economists and also junior and past economists. Um, and this event, it was made uh, uh, possible and uh, successful even. Uh, because of the well wishes of Sanem. And uh, on behalf of, the, of Sanem, uh, uh, we would like to especially thank you, first of all, uh, the two keynote presenters, uh, Professor S.R. Osmani and Professor David Hume, for their excellent inputs and valuable thoughts. Uh, then uh, I would like to uh, thank and express our gratitude to, uh, to the, the high level panel discussion. Uh, Professor Mustafizur uh, Rahman, Dr. Saman Selegama, uh, Dr. Shokoshati Kaur. Uh, I don't know whether I have missed any of other names. Uh, and, uh, 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 I'm coming. <laughs> and, and also, uh, also uh, it, it was a great failure for us, especially uh, because uh, in this event, in these two days, uh, we have been honored by the presence of Professor Rehman Sovan and Professor Wahiduddin Mahmoud. And uh, we have been immensely benefited by their gracious presence and their valuable comments. Uh, it was, uh, we, we in fact feel really honored by that. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, the foreign delegates and those who, uh, who are residing outside of the Dhaka who have taken all of this trouble to come to Dhaka and, uh, and participate in, in the last few days. Uh, finally, the thank goes to all of the paper presenters, the discussions, the chairs, and the special guests, and all of these people and their valuable inputs that has made this event a really, a truly a fruitful one. And finally, obviously, the SANEM team, uh, the researchers, the administrative staff, the support staff, all of these two, all of these people, they have for the for the last two days. And not only for the last two days, maybe for the last six months or eight months, they have been working so hard that they really deserve a great applause. So thank you all. And hopefully, we all see you again next year for the third annual Sunday Internet uh, Economics Conference. Thank you. Thank you, Vidisha. Uh, I think uh, you covered almost uh, everything. But I just add. Uh, Few things. I also, uh, you know, when I talk about Sunim family, the volunteers who worked uh, relentlessly, you know, over the last two days, even before that, I'm really thankful to them. You have actually part, become a part of Sunim family, and I also want to give a round of applause. Uh, I must thank uh, Black for their wonderful service, you know, over the last two days. Uh, it was amazing the way you know whatever we wanted they provided us with that facility and uh, you know my sincere gratitude to them uh, but i should not uh, forget to actually acknowledge the contribution of our partners and those who actually collaborated with us especially jfid manchester university uh bigd and igc mccr and DECMA. Uh, actually this is a uh, this conference actually shows the kind of model where you can work together. And if you look at the sessions, different sessions, it's not simply the collaboration, but the whole team, the, the sessions came up with different uh, themes and topics, which are very much consistent with the overall theme of the conference, managing growth for social inclusion. We talked about, uh, the, you know, in the morning, the democracy and ecology. We talked about climate change. We talked about labor market, trade policy, macro policy. We talked about in the, in the morning today, uh, uh, farm level productivity, digital services, and then responsible private sector. We talked about at the very end the climate change issues. Yesterday we also talked about the politics of growth, and then you know the whole uh, understanding of uh, how to make growth process more inclusive. In a, you know how to learn from each other in the South Asian context. So with this, I again, uh, I uh, you know again want to you know convey my sincere thanks to you, uh, 
uh, you know, I think your presence, your participation made this conference a success one. And uh, I can tell you that it's not something we just arranged and we just presented. It was a learning process for us, especially for me as well, because for the last two days, I learned a lot. Even this last session, I was from the three presenters, I learned a lot. Something which I never thought before, and something which I am really looking forward to work, especially with them, or some of the researchers, young researchers, who also want to work in, uh, on, on, these, on these topics. Um, very finally, again, I'd like to invite you before the, of course, dinner, but for the next conference, next year, February, Heart Sun and Anglicans Conference. Thank you, and please join us.